Welcome to the second Director of Soccer Development webinar. In this webinar, we're going to take a look at U.S. Soccer's player development initiatives from a technical viewpoint and how it impacts child development in soccer. We at Massachusetts Youth Soccer are in close alignment with U.S. Soccer's proposal with just a few minor variations that I'll cover towards the end of the presentation. So with that said, on we go. When it comes to youth soccer player development, it is vital to understand that children are in no way, shape or form mini adults. Sometimes we treat them as such, but we, we really shouldn't do that. We should treat them with care and make sure that we are taking care of their needs in terms of the three different domains of development and those three different domains of development are the psychomotor which is the physical aspect the cognitive which is how children process information and indeed how adults process information uh, and then the third domain is the psychosocial domain which deals with the interaction and ability to relate to others so it's really paramount that we keep this at the forefront as we think about how we're going to implement these player development initiatives. So we'll start off with what's called the lines of interaction. And the reason I think this is important for us to take a look at is if we accept that between any two players and indeed any two people, there are two lines of interaction. One is from the sender and the other is from the receiver. So what we're doing here is going to have a look at the social and processing skills as it relates to the playing numbers on the field. So as we go through this chart we can see here highlighted in yellow for the 4v4 game just how many possible decision making options there are for any player at any moment of the game. So initially we started with one going out of the sender and one going into the receiver and now as we jump the numbers up to just eight players we see that the number of interactions between that group of eight players is as many as 56 at any one time. And, and as we move through the chart here we see just how the lines of interaction exponentially increase uh, right up to the seven versus seven game. So you can see just by adding three players and, and make going from a four versus four to a seven versus seven, the lines of communication triple from where they were at the four versus four game. So ultimately it just becomes exponentially more confusing for the player on the ball when faced with so many decisions. Every time a child receives the ball, they could possibly tend to shut down and, and maybe that's the reason why they're kicking the ball away and, and, and maybe some of them will tend to avoid the ball at all costs. Uh, and not least because, you know, we're what we're talking about here is the interactions between the player on the field. In youth soccer, invariably, what we find is we have the, uh, the parents on the sidelines, the coaches on the sidelines and everybody trying to be helpful in their own way and all trying to give different information to the player so consequently you know they can maybe either shut down or as happens with the more cognitively advanced players they're able to shut out all of the white noise and just focus on the one task at hand but certainly not much more than that as you can see from the numbers here having six players six and under and eight and under playing anything other than 4v4 is not creating the best environment to enhance their processing skills. There's just far too many lines of interaction for them to cope with and still deal with a moving ball and an opponent as the game's going on. Now this slide is just a little bit of empirical data. So if we think the lines of community, if, if we think of the lines of community, of interaction as possible passing connections we should be getting a good idea of how complex the game looks for the younger players and 
how that only becomes more complex as the number of players and the field size increases. Let's take a look at this on the next, next slide. Now hopefully that looks as confusing to you as it looked to me. So it kind of makes you feel how a, maybe a six-year-old player, a five-year-old player, or even a six, seven, and eight-year-old player feels during a game. Let me outline at this point, let me outline where the four players are for each of the teams. So we've got one player, two player, three player, four players there on the one team, and then on the opposing team, hopefully you're able to see this on your screen, I'm highlighting the four players for the opposing team. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to flick flip to the next side which is kind of a little bit of an answer key which will help us make some sense of this or hopefully so for ease of understanding let's just look at the bottom three lines that are not highlighted and what's that what that's telling us is that the solid lines denote frequent or strong interactions the dotted lines are less frequent interactions and the curved lines are infrequent or the, the weakest interactions between the players. Generally, the players furthest away from the player with the ball. So with that in mind, with the solid lines, dotted lines and curved lines, as we jump back now and take another look at the diagram, we see that the strongest lines of interaction are with, without doubt within their own team which makes a lot of sense. And then also, as you can see right there in the middle of this little diagram or this schematic, you can see the ball and you can see there are strong lines of interaction between those two opposing players. So the area I'm talking about is right there. And so there's obviously a strong interaction between those two players because one of the player with the ball has to make a decision and Maybe the player without the ball has a decision to make too about what to try to do to get the ball back. So just thinking about that now in terms of the interaction levels, as we go back to this slide, now we can have a better understanding that the black lines make up 26 of the interactions are the 12 which are per team. And then there's the two between, as I said, you know, in the diagram there with the red highlight, the, the two between the first attacker and the defender. Then you've got the green interactions of which there are eight. Sorry, went the wrong way. The green interactions and the dotted lines, you could see how the outside players may come into contact with each other more frequently. Uh, and then in the curved lines, the players further away from the ball and how that impacts the amount of interactions that any one player can have. Uh, and it just follows suit with the blue, the purple, and the yellow again, to make a total of 56 lines of interaction that's, uh, that happen on the game between all of the players in a four versus four. So I think it's with that in mind that we, we really need to consider that and really understand that a layering approach to child and learning application is probably the best way to go which is one of the reasons that we, we really are in favor of having these PDIs be implement, implemented you know, across the state and across the nation. Now let's take a look at the characteristics for each of the age groups. So what we're looking at here are some, inter some characteristics for players who play for the, in the six and under. So you've got some four, five, and six-year-olds. And because of their bodies being so small and the skin surface area so small, children heat up and cool down much more quickly than we do. The reason for that is quite simple. They do everything at flat-out pace because they've not yet learned how to pace themselves. The largest part of the bodies is the head and it is also the heaviest so so that's a combination of weight dispersion and then the lack of movement education makes them appear more clumsy 
the players only slightly older than them. So, cognitively, what we try to promote is an, an environment where showing, not telling, is important because they cannot follow and process long explanations. They're not able to focus or stay interested for very long, so lots of activities are, activities are suggested for this age group. And then socially, players at this, at this age really only care about their world and themselves. So being in a team does not mean, mean much to them, hence the next slide. So just take a moment to digest that, and for all of those that you have coached, uh, six and under players playing four versus four, that's probably a pretty good representation of what it looks like. We call it a four versus four game, but it's actually a one versus seven in, in all reality. So all that we can hope for is that they come out of the game, that they've been engaged, they've enjoyed it, may look like punch ball because they all want to play with the toy the, the ball obviously is that toy uh, and then one or two of them you might find could be on the outside waiting for the ball to pop out uh, and that's a good sign and, and in all honesty that's probably going to be about as good as it gets for the six and unders so moving on to players eight and under uh, and obviously these guys are still playing four versus four. So, you know, I've had a question a time or two about, you know, why do they have to play two, two seasons or two years of four versus four? Uh, and if we think about it with, with the amount of time on task, it, it's certainly not a, a, a time span of two plus years because the seasons don't last for much longer than six to eight and at the very most ten weeks. So at the most, out of a two-year span, they've got, at best, 40 weeks of it. And if we really dial it down and boil it all down, they've probably got one day a week out of that. So maybe they've had 40 contact times with playing and training in a four-versus-four environment. But having said that, that doesn't mean that there, there, won't, there won't be some differences and there shouldn't be some differences between the six-year-olds and the eight-year-olds. So the differences that you should start to notice and a couple of things to watch out for are injuries. So from a safety standpoint, injuries that may seem to us like they're insignificant and there's only slight contact, to the, to the players themselves when they feel them, you know, they're, they're very significant and they can certainly hurt a lot because of the area that they've received the knock or the contusion to the body. Uh, and, and maybe we just want to give it a little bit more special attention than maybe we have done previously. And, and then con cognitively, yeah, they may be able to dribble with the ball, but they may not be looking to pass. So you may find that you get a lot of people who are you know, holding on to the ball a little longer than possible. And that's because cognitively they're having a difficult enough time just trying to move the ball by dribbling in it without having the ability while they're dribbling it to maybe get their head up and look for a pass. And consequently, you know, the players without the ball will stay in the vicinity of the ball, so they'll run alongside or they'll be in the general area, but not necessarily at the best supporting or defensive angles. For eight and unders, we certainly wouldn't want to be talking about supporting angles and defending angles. Uh, so we, we, you know, we just wouldn't encourage that. Players at this age are what we are in what we call the concrete operational stage of development, and they'll be quick to point out if anyone breaks the rules. So if you're a coach that likes to have hard and fast rules, or your activities come with some defined restrictions you'll know that you're dealing with a group that's in the concrete operational stage of development because any time that somebody breaks those rules, you can be assured that somebody will be pointing that out to you during the trading session. And then socially, you know, they probably have a best friend by this point in time, uh, which is one reason that we like to promote pairs activities for these players. 
uh, and any time that we can get them to work in pairs and maybe even move the ball to a friend and get the ball back from a friend, that would be what we would encourage. So let's now go ahead and take a look at a clip of the game of a little game here and see how many of those of the domains that we can actually see. So obviously it's a little bit of a restricted camera view, but even here we can see there's a lot of players around the ball and not particularly using the space well. It's, it's not far off one versus seven, but it's a little bit more advanced than that because these players are, I believe, the seven years old, so they're, they're through the six and under phase. There you see a little bit of a connection between two players. Hopefully that was deliberate. Here you see some really good ball manipulation by the young man. We've got the three defenders there. I don't know if that's deliberate or just by default. Uh, and then right at the end, I'm not sure if he was shooting or passing. So just to go through it one more time, and I'll, I'll stop the play as I see a relative point here. All right, so obviously right there, uh, that's not the best use of space. We've got a lot of players around the ball. Um, you know, it's ideally what we'd like to promote or get them to at least see is the field is a whole lot bigger than they've made it at this point in time. And maybe we could give the, the team with the ball some attacking advice as to get away from each other into spaces where they can receive the ball. And maybe one of the reasons for the poor use of space is, as we'll see here in a second, as you can see, the heads of every one of the players is eyes on the ball. Uh, and maybe that's the reason. Maybe we need to teach them a little bit that, you know, we don't always have to focus only on the ball. You know, if, if we're in possession, maybe we can look around the field and ask them, where's a better place for you to be right now? Are you going to be getting the ball first? If the answer is yes, go ahead and do it. If the answer is no, maybe moving into a better space so you, then you can help your teammates out. And then finally... Oh, we saw the work in the pass. And there we've got a 1v3, uh, and I'm not sure that he's ever actually thinking about passing the ball, the young man. I, I'm not sure that it's his fault in this particular instance. Is, it, is it, He's not thinking about passing or he's got nobody to pass to. And the argument in this picture could be that he's got nobody to pass to. But as we follow through to the end, and we all now know the outcome of this, you make up your own mind as to whether you think it was a shot or a pass. So you've got the, the young man here who's moved closer to the goal. You know, he's tried to get on the end of it. I'm not sure if he ever did, if he was able to, to finish that off. But again, I'm not sure if the young man with the ball was actually deliberately trying to make the pass there. So in terms of the elements of the domain and the social interaction, there was one or two examples there where they were trying to work with each other. In terms of the spatial awareness and the cognitive ability to think ahead and, and move into good space, obviously that still needs to be developed and refined, and, and there's certainly nothing wrong with that at this age. But these are the things that we'd like you to notice as you're coaching through these age groups going out of U6 and coming into 8 and unders, that the 8 should definitely be more advanced but, than the, the 6s, but still not a lot of cooperation and not a lot of spreading out. So as we move on from the eights, take you out of here, take it into the next slide. Now we move in and we're going to talk a little bit about the tens. 
Uh, and here, physically, you'll see a wide range of abilities. You know, those of you that are coaching U10s, uh, and the reason for that is many fold. Maybe some of them have played for a year or two, and some of them are just starting. So, you know, that'll give you a great diversity in, in playing ability. Cognitively, start to watch for those players who are able to think of workarounds. You come up with your little restrictions and your rules, and one or two of the players will start to think ahead. And, and they're the ones moving from concrete to formal operational stage of development. So that's a really good sign if you've got several of those in your team, that your team's really starting to show a little bit of maturity coming out of the eight and unders and coming, going into the ten and unders. It won't be all of them, but it should be at least one or two. And like I say, if you can get more than one or two, you've, you've really put yourself in a good position. You can certainly do more with them when it comes to complex actions like working in pairs or small groups with the ball. Uh, and now you might expect to see a few more passing combinations, you may, you know, maybe some give and goes if you've worked on it, maybe an overlap. Uh, but working in groups bigger than two for combinations it would, would be unlikely and it, you won't see a lot of it. And then socially... You know, they're certainly more into it by this stage uh, and they're definitely into wearing the uniform and all of the other accoutrements that, that come with that. So in the 7 versus 7 with, from US Soccer, we've got a couple of suggested formations here. Both, both of these are attacking formations. I'm going to diagram here some shape so we've got the shape of the overall team which is hopefully everybody can see that that's a diamond shape and then within each of the diamond shape here we can create multiple triangles and so that's why this is considered to be a really good attacking shape and as it says here to develop passing and movement of the ball not off the ball but of the ball so in this particular one with the one, two, three, one, this is allowing for movement up and down the flanks by the outside players. Uh, and here, obviously, we've given them their positional numbers. We think the positional numbers are a really good idea. It seems to ease the communication between the players and seems to reduce the amount of confusion that players may have when asked to play in certain positions. They have a basic understanding of what a 7 and where a 7 plays and where an 11 plays. Same with the 9 um, and certainly set, same with the 4 and 5 at the back and obviously with the, with the 1 as the goalkeeper. So this particular one, nice, wide, expansive, open uh, and it really plays in well for uh, passing and, and, and movement of the ball. Whereas this one, you know, it's much more of a narrow diamond as the overall team shape. Uh, and maybe we could have gone through the eight there. And then we get this triangle through the middle and this sequence of triangles off that. Uh, and it's not so expansive. But what this does do is that this really encourages the outside backs, in this case the two and the three as it shows here, to get up into the attacking third and to really uh, assist with offensive attacking type movement and play. So that, that's why we're trying to promote these two particular formations. We've got the 2-3-1 on the left and the 1-3-2-1 on the right. Now let's take a look at this little game clip here. Uh, and in this game, let's see if we see any of these formations emerging and see how the players interact, move, and make decisions. So I'm just going to pause it here. But keep your eye on this player here. It doesn't seem to do an all, all too much. It seems like he's been told by his coach, you, you play in and around this little D area here uh, and don't move all too far because we seem to find him here fairly often throughout this little video here. So you've got the three at the back 
you've just seen the two blue players move up there. There's a blue player over here. Let's just see how this play develops. And again, this is under 10, so I think it's fairly faint, but I think we've got a build out line here that we can just barely see. And the one on the other side is, is not really visible either, as you'll see, but the players do react to it. Okay, so the ball goes out for a corner kick. Watch what happens when the keeper gets possession here. Okay, so watch. And you can clearly see all of the players are heading away. Uh, certainly the blue players are heading away and trying to drop back behind this line that isn't all too visible to us, but it, it does appear to be there as you watch more of the video. Uh, and the goalkeeper plays out. Not a bad penetrating pass. Uh, and here we could argue... Uh, it's just it's just a moment of the video. You've got the two at the back, you've got the three in midfield, and you've got the one striker up top. It, you know it's not as perfect as it looked in the diagram in the previous slide, but they certainly adopted a two-three-one formation to go into attack here. And then in a few seconds, we'll just take a look at the blue team and see what they look like. All right, so we've got, you know, here we've got the three at the back. There's one player out of shot here. Uh, you know, you could probably argue that they're actually playing a 3-3, three, three, and I don't think I'd have a problem with that. Uh, but potentially we've got quite a good picture here of a 3-2-1 with the one forward up top and the two playing in behind as you'll see as the video runs here it almost becomes a three and a three so again you can see that the blue team have dropped back behind a build-up line enabling the black and white team to be able to play out now what's interesting here as we think about the domains is as the goalkeeper plays the ball short here this player's only thought is to try and get this player involved somehow unfortunately he's just not that technically equipped right now to be able to do that but there was no thought of him turning around and going back to the other side of the field which just gives you an idea of cognitively and socially where these guys are at so definitely a, a a point to work on for the coach there that collectively they're maybe not working as well uh, as they are individually now this is a nice little combination sequence here plays it in gets it back So that's not bad. That's, that's a little bit more advanced and, you know, we'd obviously like to see more of that as the game goes on. So that's about all we're going to see from this video. Okay. So moving out of the, the tens, uh, and now we're going to move into the twelves. Just take a look at some of their characteristics. Uh, Again, the players are entering or, or have ho already entered or reached the formal operation stage of development, which simply means that they're now starting to think more like adults and consequently they can handle more complex instructions. We should start to see passing sequences with three players or more start to emerge in this age group, so that's one of the things to I ways to identify 
whether any of the three domains are, are, are actually becoming more and more developed is to watch for the passing sequences uh, and those lines of interaction uh, as we go. So uh, now we have another slide with formations and obviously now we're looking at nine versus nine. So we've added a couple of players uh, and the shape isn't quite diamondish, but you can certainly see how all of the triangles emerge once we get the players to understand the attacking shape and the formation that we'd like to get them in. As opposed to the diagram on this side, which is a little bit more condensed, oops, a little bit more condensed, similar type shape, fewer players protecting the middle of the field, uh, and more players protecting in the back half of the field. So what we're saying here is that we've got this group. Ooh, that wasn't good. This group. Sorry, it's a little bit sensitive. Uh, and this group playing, trying to get them to play together. Uh, and in this one, we've got these three, these two, and these three. So that's, when we're talking about the formations, that's how we're actually talking about it. So both of these are for attacking shapes. Uh, and really, one of the things that you might think about is, well, you could utilize both of these shapes within the game. You know, when, you, when you've set up to attack, if your objective is to use build-up play through the midfield areas and pr provide multiple attacking options in the attacking third, that this, this diagram would be a really good way to try to promote that. And then once you've lost the ball and you're looking to get all of your players back and into a compact shape, that this formation may actually work better for you. So you're actually training your team to go from a 1-3-2-3 a three, three, to a 1-3-3-2. Three, three, uh, and the major defensive difference is that you're defending with six, in the 3-3-2 as opposed to predominantly defending with five in the 3-2-3. I'm not saying that 11 and 7 can't drop back in and this could be a really good defensive block but for attacking purposes what we're saying after they've attacked and lost possession further up the field the likelihood of the diagram on the right being better for defending organization is much higher than the, dif than the diagram on the left. So let's take a look at this game. This is a U12 girls game that we're going to look at now and see if we can identify any of these attacking and defensive shapes. Remember to look for player interactions as they relate to the movement and decision making and see if you can count how many passing sequences you identify. I'd argue there was an element of luck there, but that was a, at least a three-person passing combination, which you would hope to see at this age group. And watch as this player loses possession now, even though she's manipulating the ball quite well. She gives up possession here. And so the first thing you see is the range of passing doesn't quite make it there, but then there's another longer pass, again, not as accurate as we'd like, but certainly longer range of passing, another fairly long range pass, I guess, for this age group, uh, and ends up with a nice finish by the number seven. So the things to notice there is that, you know, once the attack had started, it went predominantly down the right side. There was a sequence of passing in there, though, and that was uh, that worked out okay for the white team. And now again, as we go from the kickoff, and, and maybe a little bit easier from this situation, but a sequence involving at least three players. Uh, 
again, it's a bit scrappy the game, but you know that maybe just tells us that there are things that we can work on with these players. Look for any triangle shapes. If we can get the ball down and actually look for that. A little bit of selfish, selfishness shown there by the forward. That's not a bad trait to have. Watch this for a corner. Plenty of height and loft. You certainly, it's very highly unlikely you're going to be able to see that in a U10 game or a 10 and under game. So the delivery on that particular corner kick was quite good from that young lady. A lot of uh, loft, a lot of pace, fairly accurate. So again, uh, they're trying, they're trying to move the ball, they're trying to get some passing sequences going. It's just, they've not quite got the techniques down to be able to really execute, which is, you know, this is why it becomes an individual thing that we need to really focus on, as opposed to just the team aspect. What I like about this particular sequence here is look at the concentration of players around the ball defensively. So, I mean, there certainly is some working together in... Uh, that's a fairly good-sized group for, for a 9v9 game. Uh, and yes, they do manage to clear the ball. So some fairly good examples, even in this game, uh, you know, it's a little bit kickball, but there is there are some moments where the players are trying to work together. So socially, they're a little bit more aware of each other, a bit more willing to work together. Cognitively, they have an idea of the shapes that they want to try to get in. They're just, as I said, the technique lets them down a little bit. Um, and maybe they're not always able to execute in the way that they'd like. And then physically, they're certainly able to get up and down the field. Larger size field certainly seems appropriate for the amount of space that they're filling with the amount of play players on the field. So I'll just close out of this. All right, so you know we've seen three video clips now. We've seen the 4v4 for the 8 and unders. We've seen the 7v7 for the 10 and unders. And we've seen the 9v9 for the 12 and unders. Uh, and what I want to bring your attention to in the next slide is the PDI chart. And hopefully all of you have received the PDI chart from your assigned technical, assistant technical director. And, and thanks to those of you that have returned them to us. I think we've had a most recent count, about 20 to 25 of you out of a possible 100 have got them back into us. Uh, and so hopefully this next slide will give you an idea of why we asked you to fill out the chart in the first place. Uh, so just take a second just to you know, get your mind around it. Um, so what we've got, what these thicker black lines are, is this is the fours, this is the sevens, and these are the nines to elevens. And what this is, this is a heat map, or I, I like to term it as a heat map, on the right hand side here you've got the 55 state associations who have filled out these PDI charts and turned them back into US soccer. Anywhere you see these areas of white all the way across, uh, unfortunately those states were not able to get the information back to US soccer in time. So there are five or six states who were, were not able to complete the PDI chart. But what I think it gives us is a really good idea of where we are nationally. You know, there's quite a lot of green on there, which is really good. The yellow is indicating that it's not yet been implemented, but it's going to be implemented, and that may be down to a multiple amount of reasons. You know, maybe just the timing of it. People are waiting for this August 1st date to, to arrive, and maybe they're implementing it for the fall of 2017. So different reasons why. But certainly a lot of yellow on there too. And so where we would focus, and this, and this is why it becomes so important for you guys to get these back into us, is where we would focus is we'd focus on, on the areas of need 
which are obviously the areas that are in red and the areas in red for again numerous reasons are, are areas where not only are they not planned on being implemented we're not sure that we could ever get them implemented and so for us as a uh, as a state and a state association working with you guys as the directors of soccer development we can identify these areas together and maybe this becomes a really good visual you know once we get enough responses with the PDI chart this becomes a good visual that we can send out to you guys that you can use at board meetings to show hey look as a state most of the people are actually trying to adopt and implement uh, and so we you know we're really close to it and you know let's just turn the whole thing green if we possibly can so that's what we're hoping you know and we strongly encourage you to please 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 get the PDI charts returned to us as, as soon as you possibly can we understand it's not an exact science you know but just please ask you to do the best that you can with them and if for any reason you haven't received uh, one of the charts to fill in and, and all you simply do is fill in the either green red or yellow if you haven't received the charts please let us know and we'll, we'll get the chart out to you so we can do that so hopefully we can uh, we can make that happen in the not too distant future so moving on now we're getting close to the end here as you'll be happy to hear so this is the small sided games chart that we've put together here in Massachusetts and as you can see it's very much in line with the US soccer's player development initiatives we've got some slight variations denoted by the asterisks uh, and, and an explanation of what each of the asterisks mean they're here at the bottom in this area here so it's a fairly self-explanatory form hopefully you've all seen it right now by now uh, and if you've got any questions about it please do not hesitate to contact our executive director Mike Boroslow and he will happy, be happy to walk you through it talk you through it and you know even come out to a meeting and you know I'd be happy to join Mike at the meeting and we'll do our best to try to convey what the messages we're trying to send with the small sided games chart so this will be available on the recorded version online and again if you've got any questions maybe we could uh, you could ask them either at the end of this little get together or <laughs> message from Mike Boroslaw hot coffee and cookies and he'll be there that'll be nice and so that brings us to the end of the player development initiatives um, presentation and now we're just trying to outline what the next steps are going to be for all of us again if you have if you are in possession of the player development chart document please send that to Tommy Loy or Carla uh, as soon as you possibly can please obviously your season's over so take some time away from the game relax go and enjoy your families significant others friends relatives the beach just take some time away regenerate uh, and, and come back all the more refreshed for it so the next event for us that we've got planned is the DSD training event which is going to be an on field as well as some classroom time on Thursday August 24th from 6 to 8 p.m. that's going to be at our facility at Progan Park in Lancaster and what we're going to do there is we're going to run mini pilot versions of the new grassroots coaching education courses so that you can get a taste for what they're going to look and feel like and then from that point forward we'll move forward into the fall of 2017 with all of the regional events that we uh, will have planned or we, we have in process for planning for the directors of soccer development okay so with that said I will open up to you to any comments questions that you may have
Again, please use the chat bubble for you know if you're thinking that you might have a question that you want me to you'd like me to have a go at, uh, or I'll just forward it on to Mike. Uh, Mike will be able to see it. If, just use the chat bubble that's available from your. Uh, this should be available from the top of your screen. Okay, it doesn't seem like anybody's got anything. And of course, as I say that, uh, Harash is just thanking us. Well, Harash, you are entirely welcome. Thank you. We appreciate it. And with that being said, if nobody else has got any other comments other than thank you, for which you appreciate it. Um, I'm being asked to unmute. I tried this before. I'll give it a one-time go. I'm not sure that this is going to work. We'll see. All right, so I didn't get any questions, or I certainly wasn't able to hear any questions. All right, I've got a question from Chris, actually in the bubble now. Do we know what leagues are going to adopt the new suggested rules? Uh, we're hoping that all of them are, and we're going to encourage those that are putting up some resistance to it. Um, you know, we're going to go out out to different places where we know that we've got some people who are not fully on board with it and we're going to try to convince them that it's the right thing to do for the children. Um, yeah, Chris has followed up with uh, Bayes uses a half line restriction for goal kicks. I don't know whether that's a field line in, or marking issue. It's something that we can certainly address with the people over at Bayes uh, and see what we can do to help them assist with that. Yeah, Chris, uh, uh, Chris is probably, he must be typing, he must have rapid fingers now. He says it, it, it is just his two tens, cents, but he likes the, um, the half line restriction for goal kicks better than the build out line restriction. Maybe that's because it gives your, uh, the players receiving the ball a little bit more time. Uh, I can fully understand that. I, I don't believe that that would be a problem. Uh, again, what we are trying to do is we're trying to get everybody to use. We are trying to get everybody to implement the, the player development initiatives as proposed by U.S. Soccer just to create consistency across the country. Uh, Tom Scott from Quincy has chimed in with uh, SSSL, also used the half line on goal kicks. So, yeah. Uh, and, it, yeah, the Federation is, is quite open to any input. So if we find out that we've got issues and things are not working the way that we, uh, we'd all like them to, then we can certainly take those back to US Soccer and have a conversation with them about that. Um, Johnny B has asked if we considered using the build-out line as an offside line instead. Uh, Johnny, what I can tell you is that I believe it is going to double us both. So the, the build-out line is going to be considered the offside line in each half. That is part of the player development initiative. You are very welcome. Okay, I'll just give you one more minute and uh, if there are no more questions, we can leave it at that. I, I thank you for being with me on this longest day of, the, of 2017 so far. Enjoy the rest of your summer solstice and thank you for being on one of our soccer, Director of Soccer Development Officers uh, and thank you for all that you do for the, for the game. Thank you. We'll talk soon. Bye-bye.